Hi, everyone. Welcome to Episode 3 in our survey of the most important battles in the Civil War. In the previous episode, we looked at the Battle of First Bull Run, and there was a resounding Union defeat there. This was not going to be a short war, but both sides realized that this could drag on for quite a long time. But it's not as if when the Civil War began, the first few states secede, that all other states immediately fall in line and everyone on both sides prepares for total war. There's actually a slow rollout of all the secession of all the states, and particularly amongst the border states. So that's part of what we're going to be looking at in this episode, along with the war in the West. So James, can you tell us about what is happening with the border states? Sure. Uh, We'll back up just a a second and just let me give the listeners a little bit of a time frame here. The first state, this is review from last time, but never hurts to review, right? (laughs) So the first state to go out of the Union was South Carolina in December of 1860. And then you had uh, basically almost like dominoes, the, the states of what we call the Cotton Belt or the Lower South, the Deep South, they went out one by one. The last one to go out was my home state, Texas, Uh, (laughs) Sam Houston tried to stop it, but he didn't, it didn't work. They went out, went out in February. So by February of 1861, we had seven states that had seceded. Uh, And then of course you had the firing on Fort Sumter in April of 1861. And then after that, Lincoln calls for 75,000 90 day volunteers. And that action more than anything else triggers the next wave of secessions. And we, You had Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas, what we often call the Upper South. Uh, They went out in the spring, late spring, early summer of 1861. Um, So by that time, there were still four slave states that had not seceded. Okay, so the total number of slave states was 15. Okay, you had your seven lower South ones that went out in the first wave. And uh, between December of 60 and February of 61, then you had the upper South, the four I just mentioned that went out in early 61, but the other four uh, decided to hang around at least for a little while. And we're going to talk about those Um, in those States. I'll go ahead and list them off real quick. We're going to talk about them in more detail in just a minute, one by one, but those States include Delaware, Maryland, uh, Kentucky, and Missouri. And Lincoln was determined to keep all four of those in. If even two or three of them joined the Confederacy, the Union would would be in huge trouble. Just imagine if Kentucky goes out, then the boundary between the Union and the Confederacy would be the Ohio River. So you'd have Confederate soldiers poised to possibly invade Ohio or Pennsylvania or Illinois or Indiana. So that's not a situation that Lincoln or anybody in the North wanted. All right. So uh, with that in mind, let's go ahead and th- go through those states one at a time. Uh, first state, I'm going to go ahead and dispense with this one really quickly, and that is Delaware. Delaware never seriously considered seceding. They had very few slaves, less than 2,000 slaves total, really not that many people in general. And economically, it was tied more to Pennsylvania than to the rest of the South. So Delaware was never a big threat to secede. And then I'm going to move westward, okay? We'll go to the next one over, uh, and that is Maryland, the state in which I was actually born. Um, Maryland was the most critical border state in in many ways because it surrounded Washington, D.C. on three sides. I always ask my students, okay, what would happen if Maryland had gone out of the Union? And they say, well, hmm, they look at the map and they say, hmm, and then it dawns on and, you know, the light comes on in their eyes and somebody will go, uh, they'd be surrounded. Who would be surrounded? Washington. So, yeah, if Maryland uh, seceded and joined the Confederacy, the capital of the United States of America would be in the Confederacy, completely surrounded by Confederate territory. That is completely unacceptable. Um, and so Lincoln deals with Maryland in a very heavy handed way. Um, now, I have to say that most Marylanders were pro-Union, but there was a very large or pretty large and vocal pro-Confederate minority. And um, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, there, there was quite a bit of loud 
pro secession people, especially in Baltimore, uh, the biggest city in Maryland. And Lincoln dealt with them, as I mentioned, with a very iron grip. He had pro Confederate sympathizers jailed. He prevented anti union men from voting. He sent troops into Baltimore. And he suspended the writ of habeas corpus. And I'm guessing most of our listeners know what that means. But just in case, the writ of habeas corpus means if you get jailed, then you have a right to know why you were jailed. Uh, you, you can, or you can, you can demand to, to know what your charge is, or you can be freed. But Lincoln sets that aside. And he actually, uh, that's one of the knocks against Lincoln, um, I know a lot of people that do not like Abraham Lincoln, and and this is one of the things they cite when they say Lincoln was not a great president. They say because he totally trampled on people's civil rights. Uh, But Lincoln said, hey, uh, it's wartime. It's an emergency. Sometimes I have to uh, set aside the law temporarily in this crisis. If I don't, there's not going to be any union left. There's no, you know, uh, there's no... Uh, well, I kind of lost my train of thought, but uh, there, it's just I've got to uh, do whatever I can to maintain this union, especially the state of Maryland. And by the end of 1861, Maryland was firmly in the union. I should say that most of these people that he jailed were eventually released. And before it was all over, you had had Maryland men fight in both armies. You had about 9,000 fight for the Union and actually 30,000 for the Confederates. So you had more people join the Confederate Army from Maryland than the Union Army. But despite that, uh, most of the people of the state did not want to secede. And especially, we'll see this later when we talk about the Battle of Antietam, the western part of the state was very pro-Union. Okay, shall I go on to Kentucky now? Well, let's keep going, Absolutely. Anything? Okay, so let's move next to uh, a little bit further west to Kentucky. We'll talk quite a bit about it in a minute. Kentucky was greatly divided with many people supporting the Union and many supporting the Confederacy, like Maryland. And it had strong cultural ties to both the North and the South. The more northern part of the state was more tied culturally and economically to the North, whereas the southern part was more tied to Tennessee and the rest of the South. They also had people fight for both sides. They sent about 75,000 troops to the Union and about 35,000 to the Confederacy. Kentucky did an interesting thing. Uh, At first, the governor proclaimed neutrality. They said, we're not going to join either side. We are neutral. They're going to try to do the Switzerland thing. (laughs) (laughs) Not as heavily fortified with mountains, though, so trickier. Yeah, not quite. That's not really going to work. Lincoln, though, was very wise and very smart. He was careful not to send any troops into the state. He didn't want to seem like the aggressor. So he he sat back and waited. And Lincoln famously said, I would like to have God on my side, but I must have Kentucky, (laughs) which I think is kind of a funny thing. Now, in June of 1861, Unionists won nine out of ten congressional seats. So that certainly didn't hurt the cause of Kentucky staying in the Union. And then finally in September, a Confederate force invades essentially Kentucky, uh, a force under a general named Leonidas Polk. They march into Kentucky. They occupy the western city of Columbus. And the state legislature soon proclaimed allegiance to the Union. Now, so Kentucky stayed in the Union. They, they said, well, look, the South invaded us, so we're going to stay with the North. But I must say that there was a rump Confederate government. Uh, We're going to see later that, yes, like a second, you had a second governor, a second legislature and all that. But they never really exercised any real power. They were just a government on paper for for the most part. And I do have to add a personal note here. My uh, couple of my ancestors, my direct paternal ancestors, my great, great grandfather and my great, great, hold on, two greats and one great, (laughs) my great, great grandfather and my great-grandfather, we have big generations, um, they both fought for the Union Army, and they were from Kentucky. My great-great-grandfather was named James Harvey Early, and he was a doctor in the uh, Union Army. And his son, who was my great-grandfather, Thomas R. Early, he ran away to join the Union Army when he was like 15 or 16. (laughs) He was underage, but he lied about his age like a lot of kids did. And when my when his dad, my great great grandfather, the surgeon, when he found out about it, he went and hunted him down and and took him right back home. <laughs> and said, no, son, you are not doing this. You're too young. 
but then later uh, he turned 18 and he joined up again. So uh, I had ancestors on both sides. My dad's people, for the most part, were Union, and my my mom's people were Confederate. But it's just kind of interesting. I like the story about my great great grandfather from Kentucky running off and joining when he was 16, <laughs> and then his dad grabbing him, taking him back. All right, let's move on to the next and the final of the border states, and that is Missouri. Yes. Um, getting close to you, Scott. Yes, I'm here right now, near the border, yeah. in fact, about three miles away. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, the situation there was similar to that of Kentucky in that it was greatly divided. You had some who were pro-Union, some who were uh, pro-Confederate. It's a big state, you know, the North is a little bit more, uh, was more economically tied to the North and so on. Uh, and they ended up sending 90,000 to the Union Army and 30,000 men to the Confederate. But you also had 3,000 guerrillas. Uh, and I know you're going to talk about that in just a minute, but let me just, well, well, let's just go ahead and say that you had some of this in Kentucky, but nothing like Missouri. Missouri was famous for having irregular uh, partisan warfare, if you will. It had its own mini civil war, which really went back before uh, the actual official, quote unquote, official beginning of the civil war back into the 1850s. Uh, why don't you uh, say a little about that? Yeah, that's a big issue, too, that what happens in the civil war in Missouri and really the Missouri Kansas skirmishes is something that predates the civil war, but explodes with the tensions of the civil war. So the border skirmishes are happening well before Fort Sumter in 1861. This goes back to what we mentioned a couple of episodes ago with the disputes in the 1850s about whether or not Kansas would be a free or slave state and upset the balance of for every free state that's admitted into the Union, a slave state is admitted into the Union. Um, so with that, you have different figures arising that get involved in uh, this guerrilla warfare. Uh, William Quantrill, is that the right pronunciation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's one figure, and there's a lot of others too. There's Bloody Bill Anderson, James and the James and Younger Brothers, but I'll just uh, focus on Quantrill for a second. All right. Basically, the, the points of him are that he's born in Ohio. He's a school teacher. He moves to Kansas and then Missouri. He becomes a leader of a band of about 400 guerrillas organized into smaller groups when the Civil War breaks out. They terrorize Union soldiers. They go on raids and. Probably the most famous one is he led a raid on Lawrence, Kansas, where he burned and murdered uh, people in a brutal fashion. So what's interesting about this is these skirmishes, these fightings amongst uh, guerrillas and irregulars, it almost looks like something where um, in with al-Qaeda, let's say, in Iraq or Afghanistan, where you have irregular soldiers, you can't really spot them. They might force villagers to quarter them or help them. And then other groups would come in and then retaliation attack those very same civilians. You know, the very thing that having soldiers in uniform and now the Geneva Convention tries to avoid by unnecessarily pulling noncombatants into the orbit is a lot of what happens in Missouri. So some people say in certain ways it's amongst the most bloody, brutal areas of the Civil War, depending on how you define it based on, um, yeah, it, it looks like something out of Iraq almost. Yeah, and at, uh, among those, as you mentioned, uh, you had the James brothers, Frank and Jesse James, and the Youngers, and they're going to have a big future <laughs> after the Civil War out west as famous outlaws, but we'll leave them behind for now. Yeah, that's a good point. So I think Missouri was very unique among all the states during the Civil War with all that uh, guerrilla warfare going on. I, I have to put in a plug here for a movie, too. This is a very little-known movie. But there's a movie about the irregular warfare in Missouri during the Civil War, and it's called Ride with the Devil. And uh, it has Tobey Maguire as the main character. Uh, it's a good movie. It's not fantastic, you know, but it, I'd give it a B. Uh, and it's definitely worth watching for any of our listeners that would like to see some of this portrayed in film. It shows the raid on Lawrence, Kansas. All right, so um, Lincoln puts... General John C. Fremont in command of uh, Union forces in Missouri. Fremont had run for – he had been the Republican nominee for president in 1856. He was the pathfinder, and he was one of many what, what we're going to call political generals uh, appointed for political reasons. Didn't have a tremendous amount of military background, but uh, his job is to secure Missouri militarily for the Union. And uh, 
there were a couple of setbacks. There was a battle at, called Wilson's Creek, which was a Confederate victory. There was another one at Lexington, Missouri. But ultimately, the Union forces do gradually push the majority of the Confederate forces out. And in March of 1862, at the Battle of Pea Ridge, which is actually in Arkansas, but just the extreme northeastern tip, a Union army routed uh, the Confederate army that was there, and they ensured continued Union control of Missouri. And as in Kentucky, there was a rump Confederate government. You, know, they had, you had a Confederate governor of Missouri, a Confederate legislature, and, show, and so on, but they didn't really have uh, any power, just like was the case in Kentucky. Yeah, sending senators, I think, to both uh, D.C. and uh, Richmond, if I'm not for, uh, mistaken. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and that's, that's why the Confederate flag, if you look at the stars, it has 13 stars, even though they're really only 11 states. They made a star for Kentucky and Missouri. Okay. Uh, what were you going to say? I'm sorry. Yeah, participation trophy. Um, but that was uh, yeah. <laughs> that was something important that you did mention, that they're fighting to gain control over the Missouri. So there's – the Civil War isn't just happening out in the Far East as we think of in the United States on the eastern seaboard. Um, but there is uh, a battle to particularly maintain control over these waterways, over the Missouri and the Mississippi. So – uh, could you describe some of that, the war in the West that's happening from about 1861 to 1862? Sure, I'd be glad to. Yeah, and you're right. You know, the, the situation of Virginia gets a lot of the attention. Even back then it did. Lincoln was always frustrated about how people didn't, people in Europe and whatnot didn't pay attention to what was going on in the West because as we're going to see, the Union does better, much better in the West than it does in the East for a long time. But um, – for our listeners, maybe, I don't know, uh, we probably have some listeners that live in Kentucky or Tennessee or used to, but maybe some of our listeners don't know the geography too well. So let me describe, Kentucky is kind of like, oh, how do you describe it? It's kind of like a triangle, like Virginia almost, but you have uh, the, the southern border of Kentucky is just flat. It goes east to west. And it's interesting, in the um, western part of the state, you have this area... Uh, this area where there's a whole bunch of states coming together. You have where the Mississippi River is. You have Tennessee, uh, Arkansas, Missouri, Illinois, and Kentucky all right there together. In fact, I was there last year, and I remember driving around. It's like, oh, welcome to Kentucky. Welcome to Illinois. Welcome <laughs> to Missouri. I kept crossing state boundaries constantly. And I, you know, I'm from Texas where you have to drive several hundred miles to get to the next state. <laughs> I wasn't used to all this like constantly. My, my girls are going, dang, are we – Back in Kentucky, or back in Illinois, but um, so a union of uh, so Kentucky uh, the the east I'm sorry western side of Kentucky runs up against the Mississippi River, and you have the cities the, the key cities over there are Paducah and Columbus, and then Kentucky of course goes all the way over to where it intersects with Virginia. You have the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains, the uh, Cumberland Mountains way over on the east side. Um, in the middle of the state, you have Bowling Green. And then the north part of the state, you have Louisville, which is right on the Ohio River, bordering with Indiana. Directly below Kentucky is Tennessee, of course, and beautiful state. Both of those are, actually. And uh, Tennessee is basically almost like a, a parallelogram for all you math geeks out there. <laughs> it's it, it, Both of the, the northern boundary and the southern boundary uh, just go straight across east to west. And uh, the western boundary of Tennessee is the Mississippi River, which runs roughly north-south, not exactly, but pretty close. And then the other side of Tennessee butts up against North Carolina, and it's kind of not really north-south. It's southwest to northeast. So Kentucky on top, Tennessee on bottom, Mississippi River is on the uh, west side and the far side of both states. Um, so that's the mental map. I hope that helps. I hope I didn't confuse people more than I <laughs> cleared it up. Um, Sounds good to me. So, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm actually have the advantage of I'm actually looking at a real map. So, um, so listeners, if it's possible, go on to Google and pause us and pull up a map because it really does help. But I will do my best to make uh, you know just try to let you know where everything is going on in the grand scheme of things. All right. So in the West, uh, Fremont kind of – General Fremont, who was in Missouri, we talked about him. He ran afoul of President Lincoln, and he gets uh, removed from Missouri, and he's replaced with a man named Henry Halleck. Henry Halleck was a career soldier, like most of our 
the, the top generals in this war. They, he was a West Pointer. He was put in charge of all Union forces in the far west. And, you know, when I say far west, I don't mean California and, <laughs> you know, Nevada, places like that. At this time, the far west was the Cumberland River West. We'll talk a little bit more the, about the Cumberland River, but the Cumberland River goes – it flows out of the uh, Mississippi and it goes down into Kentucky, a little bit into Tennessee and back up. Uh, so he's got the western – one third of Union uh, troops and everything. Um, he Halleck was a brilliant scholarly general. He had been a professor at West Point. He had actually been offered at one point a full professorship at Harvard, but he turned it down. Uh, he had written books on military tactics. So this is one of those professors, you know, when you go on and it's like, oh, great. The professor wrote the textbook <laughs> himself. So I guess I better read it. I can't, can't you know, do a snow job on him. Uh, he had taught, as I said, at West Point. But he was very much a desk general. Uh, Halleck didn't have a whole lot of experience in actually going out and leading troops in the field, which is actually true of most generals in the Civil War. But Halleck was ordered to pacif- finish up pacifying Missouri and gain control of as much as the Mississippi as possible. We talked about that last time. Part of the Union's plan was to – they wanted to gain complete control of the Mississippi, which would cut the Confederacy in two. Um, Another main general in this story is a man named Don Carlos Buell, B-U-E-L-L, Buell. And Buell commanded all Union forces from East Tennessee west of the Cumberland. So if you think about uh, – look at – think of – visualize a map of the U.S. and go from the Appalachian Mountain chain all the way over to the Mississippi. Halleck has the western half of that area and, and Buell has the eastern half for, for the Union, of course. Lincoln wanted Buell to liberate East Tennessee and cut the railroad connections between Virginia and Tennessee. He, uh, that would be cutting off the, the eastern seaboard part of the Confederacy from uh, kind of the middle of the Confederacy. And you had a lot of uh, unionists in East Tennessee, people that they didn't want to secede from the Union. Uh, it was a very mountainous region, and Lincoln wanted to come to their aid. So that's the Union situation. We've got Buell in command in uh, – kind of the middle of the country uh, from an east-west standpoint, and then you've got Halleck in the far west. Hey, everyone. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. The History of North America podcast is a sweeping historical saga of the United States, Canada, and Mexico from their deep origins to our present epoch. Join me, Mark Vinette, on this exciting, fascinating, epic journey through time, focusing on the compelling, wonderful, and tragic stories of North America's inhabitants, heroes, villains, leaders, environment, and geography. I invite you to come along for the ride. War has played a key role in the history of the United States, from the nation's founding right down to the present. Wars made the United States independent, kept it together, increased its size, and established it as a global superpower. Hi, I'm James Early, host of the Key Battles of American History podcast. In each episode, I discuss American history through the lens of the most important battles of America's wars. To start listening now, go to ParthenonPodcast.com or search Key Battles of American History on your favorite podcasting platform. Once in a generation... A podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. Let's talk about the Confederate situation, so we're going to set this up. The Confederacy didn't have two commanders in the West. They had a single commander, which that comes in handy. You don't have to consult with anybody. You don't have to debate or persuade somebody. You just got one guy in charge. And the man they had in charge was named Albert Sidney Johnston. And I don't want people to get confused because we talked about another Johnston last time, Joseph Johnston, who was in command of the Confederate Army in the East, they, they have, there's no relationship between the two. But uh, Albert Sidney Johnston was an interesting fella. He 
had been in the U.S. Army. He was a West Pointer, served in the U.S. Army when uh, Texas declared independence from Mexico. He resigned from the uh, U.S. Army and joined the Texas Army, hmm. and he fought in the Texas Revolution. Yeah. He adopted Texas as his home state. Later, he uh, went in the Republic of Texas. He was the commander of all Texas forces, so he was like the head of the Texas Army. When uh, Texas rejoined the Union, he rejoined the U.S. Army. And then when, when Texas seceded from the Union, he was out west in California. He was a colonel in the Army. He resigned his commission and came back to become a Confederate general. He was actually the senior Confederate officer, at least in the field. There was one, one general that ranked above him who was just a, a desk general in Richmond the entire war. But so Albert Sidney Johnson had a lot of military experience. He knew the South. He knew uh, he was originally from Kentucky, so he knew Kentucky. Uh, Davis thought highly of him, President Jefferson Davis. He said, if Sidney Johnson is not a general, then we have no general. So that's high praise. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Davis was a military man himself. I don't know if we mentioned that last time, but Jefferson Davis had served in the Mexican War as a colonel, and he had been Secretary of War for the United States under President Pierce. So he he understood war, and he understood what it was like to run an army. Uh, so Johnston is is in command. He's trying to keep as much of Kentucky as he can for the Confederacy. He's certainly trying to hold on to Tennessee, uh, which the Union very much wanted to get control of. Kentucky and Tennessee, but his theater was most vulnerable in four places. So we'll go from west to east. The Mississippi River was vulnerable because the Union had uh, obviously quite a few troops that were able to come down the river, plus the Union had complete naval supremacy. The Confederacy had no river boats, at least no gunboats, at least not at the beginning. Uh, Then you have the Tennessee River, which... uh, comes out of, actually, I think it's technically out of the Ohio River, um, but ultimately joins up with the Mississippi. The Tennessee River runs roughly north and south, uh, roughly parallel to the Mississippi River, uh, a couple hundred miles to the east. And then you have the Cumberland, which is the next river over that we've already mentioned. And then finally, uh, we have, um, sorry, I lost my place. Oh, the Louisville-Nashville Railroad, which Amazingly enough, it connects the cities of Louisville and Nashville. <laughs> How about that? How about that? Yeah, that's not a – it wouldn't be a tough test question if you had that one. So uh, as I mentioned, Johnston is trying to protect Tennessee, and he arranges his forces along a giant arc, kind of the shape of a smile. On one end, the left, it was anchored at Columbus, Kentucky on the Mississippi. There he had 12,000 troops under General Leonidas Polk. Uh, Polk is an interesting guy. He had been an Episcopal bishop. (laughs) He was a West Point grad who uh, went into the army for a while and then um, quit and became a man of the cloth. But then when the war broke out, he threw away his vestments and (laughs) put on a uniform. And anyway, he's going to be on the far west side. The right flank was anchored at Bowling Green, Kentucky. He also had some troops even further over near the Cumberland Gap. But in between, there were two forts, Fort Henry on the Tennessee River and Fort Donelson on the Cumberland. These were major Confederate forts that if the Union was going to get control of Tennessee, they were going to have to take over these forts. Um, Johnston also had an army in Arkansas under General Earl Van Dorn. And as I mentioned before, he had one at Cumberland Gap under Felix Zollicoffer. So think Arkansas all the way over to the Cumberland Gap, which connects um, Kentucky and Virginia, and it just kind of droops in the middle. And two forts I mentioned are right below it. So now Johnston had it. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I think it, like you mentioned, with the naval superiority that the Union has, it's easy to imagine they have all of the um, superiority in terms of armaments and numbers. But um, what are advantages and disadvantages that uh, the Confederacy might have? Well, Ironically enough, again, we talked last time about how the Union was way superior in total amount of railroad track, but uh, Johnston had uh, an advantage because he had a terrific railroad along which he could move his forces. He had an east-west railroad, so let's say the Union hits him uh, near Columbus, Kentucky. He could move some guys over from uh, Bowling Green, for example, Um, but his position in the middle was relatively weak, and the Federals... Uh, as is almost always the case throughout the entire war, they had more men 
and they had these rivers. And we, we were talking about the, the ships or the gunboats a minute ago. I don't know if you can really call them ships. These are river boats, but they have these, this, these beautiful rivers. You have the Tennessee River, which comes from the north and juts right into Tennessee. You have the Cumberland River, which comes into Tennessee and then back up into Kentucky. And they have the Louisville-Nashville Railroad that we were talking about. So they're going to try to take advantage. Um, one thing we'll see again and again that our listeners need to keep in mind is that back in this time, roads were very, very poor quality. Uh, obviously, everybody I'm sure knows they didn't have interstates. I mean, <laughs> they weren't even built until the 1950s. But, um, but I mean, most roads were dirt roads, you know, just really cheesy pig trails. And when it rained... They turned into mud, and they were almost impossible to uh, to move along. But uh, you had these beautiful, uh, in some cases, railroads and these beautiful rivers that the Union could just sail their gunboats down. That's a huge advantage for the North. So both sides have a couple of advantages and a couple of disadvantages. All right. So, All right. so you mentioned uh, the map or the forts, uh, Henry and Donaldson. So right. Um, how does that figure in to this kind of the movement of chess pieces on the on the board between the two sides? Right. Well, uh, what what the Union General Halleck, the Union commander, he really wanted to take the city of Nashville, Tennessee. It's by far the most important city in Tennessee. It's the state capital. And uh, if Nashville were to fall to the Union, then Johnston would probably have to pull completely out of Tennessee or at least into southern Tennessee. So that would be a huge advantage. And the way to get to it is along the rivers. The uh, city of Nashville is on the Cumberland River. So really, uh, okay, it was protected by Fort Donaldson, though. I mentioned Fort Donaldson. Fort Donaldson is on the Cumberland River in the extreme northern part of Tennessee, just a few miles west of Nashville. So what Halleck wanted to do was send some infantry uh, on foot over land, but also send some boats around on the Cumberland River. But they had to get rid of Fort Donaldson. But before they could do that, they had to get rid of Fort Henry. And he also wanted Grant to cut the railroad, that beautiful Southern Railroad that I talked about a minute ago. Uh, So um, before that, though, Buell, the commander, the one I said who's kind of in the middle, uh, he sent an army under General George Thomas. George Thomas is going to have a big future, as we will see. George Thomas was a Virginian who stayed loyal to the Union. He goes to Mill Springs, and he defeats the Confederate general named Zollicoffer, and he kills the general, uh, Zollicoffer, and he forces the rebels to retreat from eastern Kentucky. So Buell, uh, Thomas, under Buell's orders, he cleans the Confederates out of eastern Kentucky. Then... Back over in uh, the more western part where General Halleck is, he sends 15,000 men under a general that we all will get to know and love, or in some cases maybe people will hate him, (laughs) Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, And I'm not sure. I think I'm going to do the bio of Grant a little bit later. I want to sketch him out, but let's let's hold off on that for now. Uh, Grant at this time is just a brigadier general, a one-star uh, so Halleck gives Grant 15,000 men, and, and they march along the Tennessee River, and they also have with them a flotilla, which is just a group of gunboats under Flag Officer Andrew Foote. So the Navy and uh, Admiral Foote, or Flag Officer, it's basically an Admiral, uh, Foote and Grant work together. The Navy and the Army work together in harmony, and they take Fort Henry on February 6th. That was pretty easy because it wasn't a very strong fort for reasons I won't go into. So Fort Henry falls on February 6th, 1862. Then Grant marches south, and he cuts the railroad. Then he marches east toward Fort Donelson. The fleet had to go back the way they came, back down the Tennessee, which on a map is actually north. It's, it looks like it's up, but you say down the river. Then they had to get into the Cumberland River, the next river over, and move down to Donelson. Uh, Johnston pulls out – General Albert Sidney Johnston, the Confederate overall commander, he pulls out of Bowling Green – He sends some of his army to Fort Donelson and some to Nashville. He realizes that his position is no longer tenable in Kentucky. So by this point, Kentucky is pretty much lost completely. And Johnston is just trying to hold on to Tennessee. Uh, Grant, meanwhile, marches to Fort Donelson, the second fort. He surrounds it. The flotilla bombards it. And uh, 
you know, the Confederates do the best they can and they hold out for a while, but eventually the commander ha- realizes he has to surrender. His name was Simon Bolivar Buckner, and he contacts Grant and he asks for terms of surrender. And Grant makes a f- statement, which is, to this day is a very famous statement in American history. Grant says, no terms except unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. I propose to move immediately upon your works. Buckner didn't like that. He thought it was ungentlemanly, unchivalrous, <laughs> <laughs> because they knew each other. They were friends before the war, which is the case in a lot of in a lot of situations. We're going to see a lot of battles. The two generals on either side had known each other. They had maybe been friends. They'd been classmates at West Point. Uh, Buckner had actually loaned Grant money at one point. <laughs> Wasn't going to get that care. loan back. Yeah, that's right. I want unconditional surrender. And uh, so Buckner surrenders the fort on February 16th. 12,000 Confederate soldiers became prisoners and many supplies were captured. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. The History of North America podcast is a sweeping historical saga of the United States, Canada, and Mexico from their deep origins to our present epoch. Join me, Mark Vinette, on this exciting, fascinating, epic journey through time, focusing on the compelling, wonderful, and tragic stories of North America's inhabitants, heroes, villains, leaders, environment, and geography. I invite you to come along for the ride. War has played a key role in the history of the United States, from the nation's founding right down to the present. Wars made the United States independent, kept it together, increased its size, and established it as a global superpower. Hi, I'm James Early, host of the Key Battles of American History podcast. In each episode, I discuss American history through the lens of the most important battles of America's wars. To start listening now, Go to ParthenonPodcast.com or search Key Battles of American History on your favorite podcasting platform. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. So Grant, he reels off very quickly in 10 days, two victories. In 1862, uh, when the we're going to see in our in a future episode that the uh, the Union Army in the East is just sitting around in Washington doing nothing. Uh, so this is great news uh, for the Union government and the, just the Northern people in general. They now have a new hero. In fact, because Grant's initials are U.S., they start saying, "Well, it really stands for Unconditional Surrender." Grant. So Grant develops a reputation, and rightly so, for being somebody who actually fights when so many Union generals just seem to, just, they're, they, they're wimps. <laughs> they don't fight. They, they, they're, they're chicken. Um, and not too long after this, on February 24th, Nashville falls. It's the first Confederate state capital to fall into Union hands. That's significant. And so Johnston has basically lost round one of the chess game. Uh, he realizes he's, well, a, Bad analogy. Chess games don't have rounds. <laughs> yeah, we're going to mix actually, analogies. The dominoes yeah, are going to fall like, well, like a house of cards. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Checkmate. Well, let's just say the first game ended. Let's think of it as a tournament with multiple games. Uh, the first game goes to the north. Johnston has to basically pull almost completely out of Tennessee. Um, he brings his forces back to the extreme southern part of Tennessee, and even some of the troops get deployed in northern Mississippi and Alabama. So uh, there you go. So good news for the Union in the West. Uh, We have a general that seems to understand the concept of fighting and winning. And that's where I'll leave off there. Do you have any questions or anything you wanted to add? Well, we'll get into this more in the next episode. But a lot of the momentum that the Union has ends up being squandered uh, mostly by Halleck and some mistakes he makes. And in fact, 
Uh, there's a book by Edward Bonnekemper, who's written a lot of books on the Civil War, and he has one called The Ten Biggest Blunders of the Civil War. And one of those blunders he mentions is Halleck uh, messing up this momentum. One thing is that... Uh, spoiler alert! Yeah. Spoiler alert! I'll just mention... A, Come on, Scott, can't you, give it, can't you just let okay. him savor the victory for now? All right, well, I'll let him savor the victory, but I will mention one thing about Grant, because this is worth mentioning, because this lets us, you know, pull back a little bit, and... I think this is my use in this series to get a little bit more meta here. So there's tensions that break out between Halleck and Grant. And one thing that won't be a spoiler is that has to do with rumors that Grant had been drinking um, and that Uh he's been depicted as a drunkard for a long time. Um, And, okay, he loved his whiskey. There's no question about that. But come on, it's the Civil War. Who doesn't love whiskey? Uh, But one um, thesis about Grant really rose in the wake of the Civil War, uh, what we have called the myth of the lost cause, that uh, especially Southern historians would say, well, it wasn't a lost cause for the South. They, how do you describe this? They could have won, but they didn't win. And Union victory is depicted almost like Russians in World War II, where they grossly and indiscriminately threw men's lives and they won, but only by gross negligence, and Grant was this butcher at the top of it. Um, And I think that's a good point to make that one of my least favorite cliches about history is that history is written by the winners. It's a way for people to feel smug and question sources. History is not written by the winners. History is written by the people who write it. And what I mean by that is the South was much more interested in writing history after the Civil War because it happened mostly on their turf. They were more concerned with it. And as a result, Southern historians crafted a lot of the narratives that we still have today, that Robert E. Lee was this genius in every way. Uh, Grant was a butcher. And I think Grant's reputation is really starting to improve, especially in recent years. Um, yeah, it really is. You're starting to have a lot of bios come out uh, of Grant, and they're, they, they're really trying to, I guess, rehabilitate him, if you will. But, I mean, yeah, why history is not written by the winners. In fact, the losers can shape the narrative nor. I mean, James, you were in um, Central or Eastern Europe. Uh, do Serbians still talk about Kosovo in 1389? Oh, man. You, know? you can't even get through one coffee drinking session with <laughs> – Without that, yes, 1389, yes, and we're still fighting the battle. And Turks, if they know a little bit of history, they might know it, but they really can't tell you much more about it than that. Like, yeah, I guess my forefathers won a battle. That's nice. But uh, so this is something that I think can color some of these figures. And um, yeah, we'll we'll look at Grant and Lee and other the famous figures in much more depth in the future. But just to keep in mind that the narratives that we have today. Um, some of them are correct, but others were created to serve a particular agenda in the past that were still working to dismantle some of the, the false presuppositions in there. Yeah, it's amazing how durable some of these myths can be, too. Right. Well, I don't want to spoil anything else before we get into Shiloh, but anything else before we wrap things up? No, I think this is a good place to stop, and we'll see uh, what Grant is, what his next move is going to be. All right, we'll see you all Thanks for listening to the Key Battles in the Civil War podcast. Shiloh. Be sure to subscribe to the show and the podcast player of your choice, and leave us a rating and a review. This helps us grow and reach new listeners. You can also find maps of the battle sites, show notes each episode, and plenty of other history info by going to keybattlesinthecivilwar.com.